السلام عليكم. This is Dr. Mariam Abdullah, a professor in orthodontics and a senior orthodontic consultant. Our lecture today is going to be about cephalometry, and our reference is going to be chapter six from Laura Mitchell and Simon Littlebolt, uh, an introduction to orthodontics, fifth edition. This topic will be covered in three lectures. Right, so just to know where exactly the cephalometry fits in the process of uh, diagnosis and treatment plan for our patient, it's important to know that we need to, first of all, collect data from the patient in order to reach a proper diagnosis. This includes the interview when we talk to the patient, uh, ask about the, his personal information, and ask about uh, dental history, medical history, social his history, etc., etc. The second source of, of information is the clinical examination, the extraoral examination, and the intraoral examination. And after that, if indicated, if necessary, we can go for further records, photos, study models, and radiographs. One type of radiographs that is uh, beneficial for uh, orthodontic patients is the lateral cephalogram. And this is why it's important to understand the proper analysis and the proper use of such a radiograph. So after we collect the data, we analyze it, we reach a proper diagnosis and a problem list. And after that, we uh, build a proper treatment plan that is uh, suitable for that specific patient. Right, so cephalometrics literally is the measurement of head. Cephalogram is the 2D standardized radiograph that records the anatomy of the craniofacial region in order to study the relationship between teeth, bone, and soft tissues of the head. There are two types of such radiograph, lateral cuff and posterior, posterior anterior cuff. When we want to I pronounce the whole word, cephalometrics, cephalogram, cephalometric analysis, cephalostat. We usually use the uh, C uh, sound. But when we use the abbreviation, uh, we say kef. So either way, you, you know exactly what we're talking about, the lateral kef or posterior anterior kef, right? Cephalometry, is the actual analysis and interpretation of standardized radiographs of facial bones in order to get the, uh, the wanted data and the numbers that should be translated later on into a clinical findings. Right, a Broadbent and Hofreth in the 1930s developed this technique. Broadbent in specific, actually the idea uh, that he was trying to apply was to use both the lateral cephalogram and the posterior anterior cephalogram together in order to reach a 3D measurements, a 3D measurements. But it was a little bit difficult and we ended up using very commonly the, the lateral cephalogram and less commonly the posterior anterior uh, type of it. The anterior posterior radiograph can also be taken in the cephalostat in the same settings with the same machine, but this view is difficult to interpret and is usually only employed if skeletal asymmetry exists in the transverse dimension. So if you have skeletal asymmetry, then it is indicated to use this radiograph in addition to the lateral cephalogram as necessary. So this is the old setting by Broadbent uh, in order to take the anterior posterior and the lateral view. So this is the lateral view and this is the posterior anterior view. And the idea was to combine both in order to achieve uh, a 3D measurements and 3D data. After World War I, Broadbent developed the cephalostat to standardize the process of taking cephalometric radiographs. It's important to standardize this process so that we can compare different patients together and we can compare radiographs for the same patients taken at different times. So the standardization includes that the collimated X-ray source is positioned about five to six feet away from the sagittal plane of the patient. 
right side of the patient's head and is directed toward the ear rods. And uh, we, uh, we fit these ear rods in the external auditory meatus to help to standardize the position of the head. So the patient does, cannot tilt his head to the right or to the left. And uh, at the same time, it's, uh, it can indicate uh, for the radiologist where the uh, X-ray uh, source should be, uh, should be aiming to, to what structure. Um, this is not 600 centimeters, this is 60. This is my mistake, this is a 60 inch. So please make sure that you understand that this is a 60 inch, which is equal, as we said, to one and a half to 1.8 uh, meters. Uh, this one here is 15 centimeters, where the thumb is positioned uh, um, at the other side of the patient's head. These that are inserted inside the patient's ears are the ear roots, and they help to uh, standardize the uh, direction of the uh, irradiation source. And it will help to prevent the patient from moving to the right and to the left to tilt his head. Um, so the thumb is combined with rare earth um, uh, metal intensifying screen and is placed one foot, which is about 30 centimeter behind the mid sagittal plane uh, of the patient. Now, these fixed conditions should give on average seven to eight percent of magnification. But the exact magnification for a specific uh, machine, uh, you need to go back to the instructions and you need to go back to the manual to read exactly the uh, magnif magnification. It can reach up to 12 or uh, all the way down to 5. It depends on the machine and on the settings. So this is the source of the machine. This is the ear rod and this is the thumb. This is the mid sagittal plane of the patient. So a total, a total setting of two meters, 1.5 to 1.8 behind, and about 15 to 30 centimeters um, uh, between the patient's sagittal plane and the thumb. <sighs> Continue with the cephalostat. So we said that the ear rods will prevent the head from going to the right, to the left tilting. What about anteriorly and posteriorly? Well, using natural head position can make this uh, position more reliable uh, within the cephalostat because it will uh, help the patient to position his head in a more reliable and more repeatable position. What's the natural head position? We ask the patient to stand uh, upright and relax his uh, hands to his sides and to look uh, into the mirror. Usually there is a mirror in front of him in that setting to look uh, into his own eyes and not to tilt upward or downward, just to look forward, straight forward. Or if there is no mirror or if the patient is uh, needs guidance, then we can use the Frankfurt plane as a reference in order to orient his head backward and forward so that the Frankfurt plane should be parallel to the horizon. The Frankfurt plane is the line between the inferior border of the, of the orbit and the uh, upper part of the tragus of the ear. Okay. Of course, teeth should be in maximum interpaspation, in centric occlusion. Okay. Uh, the patient should not be opening his mouth. He should not be protruding his mandible or displacing his mandible. It should be in the maximum intercuspation. Lips should be at their habitual relaxed position, not forced together, not departed, not being apart. We should instruct the patient to, to uh, sit in the natural head position, relax, relaxing his lips in the natural position. Okay. Uh, and aluminum wood or barium sulfate could be used if we want to enhance the soft tissue definition. So this is the end result. As you can see, a lateral cephalogram properly taken. And uh, these round parts here are the ear rods. <coughs> and this part here is the scale, is a metal um, uh, ruler in order to tell the magnification scale if needed. <coughs> And usually it is positioned within the soft tissue nasion. And the soft tissue nasion is the deepest part of the bridge of the nose. Right. 
So just to make it more clear. So this is a ruler and it counts five mil, one centimeter and so on. And you can measure it against a real ruler and you can tell the magnification for the setting of this specific radiograph. This is the ear rod. And this is taken properly because both ear rods are properly uh, superimposed on each other. Digital radiographs, uh, where the image is stored electronically and viewed directly on the computer screen. And this carries lots of advantages uh, if compared to the conventional uh, radiographs, uh, because this will eliminate processing faults. Storage and transfer of images is very much facilitated. It's easier to share radiographs among uh, specialists if you want a joint clinic or a multidisciplinary uh, decision uh, regarding the patient. Digital analysis is enabled, so you don't have to go through the manual, lengthy process of manual analysis of the radiograph. So usually this is what you see on the screen, and these lines are part of uh, specialized software that helps to identify uh, points and lines and then it will actually give you uh, all the measurements necessary uh, as a result of analysis of this radiograph. So do we take radiographs, uh, cephalogram uh, in specific for all orthodontic patients? Of course not. And we should have a proper indications. If we need further information for diagnosis, then we can take it. Sometimes for treatment planning, to monitor growth for the patient, as a pre-treatment records, or to assess treatment progress in the middle of the treatment, or uh, at the after treatment uh, to assess and follow up relapse. Uh, localization of unerupted tooth, we will talk about this in a minute. And for research purposes, we will also talk about this as well. Uh, aid diagnosis and treatment planning. Well, sometimes patients who present with mild uh, class 1 malocclusions, we can treat them successfully without the need for cephalometric, uh, cephalo cephalogram or cephalometric analysis. So if I am planning to move the incisors anterior posteriorly, I want to change their position in the anterior posterior dimension, or if the patient is presented with a skeletal discrepancy in the anterior posterior dimension, then maybe a cephalogram can be beneficial for diagnosis and treatment planning. Also to monitor growth, especially patients who are still in the adolescence growth spurt, uh, are still growing and there are changes in the skeletal pattern, then maybe to monitor growth uh, for some cases, especially class three cases uh, is important for treatment planning and diagnosis. Cephalograms are not the radiograph of choice to localize an unerupted tooth. If you have an unerupted tooth, there are lots of other ways to, look, to localize it. We can use combi CT scan, which is more accurate. We can use a uh, vertical bar uh, parallax technique or horizontal parallax technique. But if it happened that this patient who has unerupted tooth uh, for other for other reasons, for other indications, we took a, a cephalogram, then why not to use this radiograph to help us to localize the unerupted tooth? Pre-treatment records as a baseline, yes, uh, especially if a growth modification and incisor movement is planned, we can take it so that later on we can compare uh, the progress of our treatment uh, with the pre-treatment records. To monitor treatment progress, especially in severe malocclusions where you had to move the teeth considerable in a considerable amount. Or if you're using functional appliances that aims to uh, modify growth, uh, or for using fixed appliances that usually move teeth uh, in three dimensions. Uh, we can also use cephalogram uh, if you want to monitor incisors inclination and anchorage requirements in the middle, in the, in the middle of the treatment. Uh, again, it can give you information about movement of unerupted teeth or upper incisor root resorption. Again, this is not the radiograph of choice for such information, but 
if the red graph is there for other indications, of course, we can use it for uh, to help us to uh, decide on the amount of uh, movement that uh, occurred to the unerupted tooth or to the amount of resorption for the upper incisors. Now, near end of treatment, near end of treatment, that means the appliance is still fixed and bonded on the patient's teeth. Near end of treatment in severe malocclusions, uh, sometimes we take a cephalogram in order to uh, plan our finishing stages and to help to uh, decide exactly on the retention needed for this patient. Uh, sometimes, if everything looks okay, we can take the red graph after the end of treatment in order to follow up uh, cases with a questionable stability. Uh, or with, uh, with the residual growth uh, that is expected to be unfavorable, then we, take, we can take end of orthodontic treatment in order to follow up such patients. But in general, end of treatment, uh, we rarely take a cephalogram because the appliance has already been removed, nothing could be done. Uh, of course, unless, as we said, the patient has uh, expected unfavorable growth or um, stability is questionable and we want to follow up the patient. For research purposes, in the past, they used to use it for longitudinal studies uh, where they took serial cephalograms, but nowadays it's not ethical at all uh, due to the risk of ionizing radiation. So to take a cephalogram only for the purpose of research, this is unethical. This is not appropriate at all. But patients who already are going through orthodontic treatment, where the cephalogram is already indicated, we can use these data for the purpose of orthodontic and for research and uh, studies. Now, before, before cephalometric analysis, we need to check the radiograph for uh, pathology. Uh, we need to look at the roots of the teeth, especially the incisors. We need to look at the patency of the uh, airways, this area here. And then after we look at the overall features, then we move to a more specific analysis. To do so, there are two types of, actually three types of analysis. The first is a pure manual. So where you need your viewing box, a light box, a dark room, pencil, rubber, um, a ruler, protractor, and tracing paper. And you actually sit in a dark room, you, um, and you put your radiograph and you put the tracing paper above it and you start to draw. The outlines, you start to identify points, you start to draw the lines, and you start to go for measurements. So this is a pure manual way. The, uh, the second way is like in between manual and digital. So the radiograph is still paper-based. It's, it's a printed radiograph. But what we use is a digital viewing box. So th this is a digital viewing box that is uh, connected uh, with a special mouse that is connected to the computer. Uh, you fix your uh, radiograph in a specific position. And with this mouse that is connected to the computer, you start to identify outlines, points, and then the computer with the software built in will, uh, will uh, finish the rest of the measurements and the rest of the uh, analysis for you. Or it could be purely digital where the radiograph is actually a digital inside, you know, you, you view it on the uh, computer screen and with the uh, conventional mouse on your laptop or on the computer, you start to uh, identify points and landmarks, etc., etc. So it is purely digital method. Uh, either way, what you need to do, you need a dark room, a well illuminated viewing screen, tracing paper, a sharp pencil, ruler, protractor, and masking tape. What uh, you need at the same time, of course, <clears throat> is the proper knowledge. You need to know the definitions of landmarks to be able to identify them. You need to understand that what you're looking at is a 2D uh, radiograph that represents a 3D structure. So bilateral landmarks 
uh, are usually overlapping each other, so you need to take the average. You need to practice the analysis until you reach to a level of error uh, up to 0.5 millimeter for linear measurements and 0.5 degrees for angular measurements. The first stage uh, for cephalometric analysis is to, tra is to trace the uh, soft tissue outline and bony outline. After that, you identify landmarks. And after that, you produce geometric constructions. You connect these dots to form lines and then later on angles, etc. And then finally, you do your measurements. So the first step is to draw the soft tissue outline as far as possible. So just to show you here. So this is the soft tissue outline. As far as the forehead, we draw it all the way down. This is the, uh, as we said, the soft tissue nasion, which is the deepest part of the bridge of the nose. And then we move down. So we draw this with our pencil on the tracing paper, on the viewing box that we talked about. This is the lower border of the nose, and this is the start, or this is the, um, uh, the angle between the nose and the uh, lip. So this is the nasolabial angle. This is the upper lip, vermilion border, and this is the lower lip. And this is the anterior border of the soft tissue covering the mandible, the chin, all the way down to the neck, okay, as far as we can go, as far as we can see. So this is the first step, okay? It's the soft tissue uh, outline. Now we're gonna go to the outermost bony shadow of the calvarium down to the nasal bone. So this is the calvaria, the frontal bone. This is, we, we're, we, don't, we're, we don't want the soft tissues anymore. Now we're gonna move to the bony tissues. So we move frontal bone all the way to the frontonasal suture and then the nasal bone that looks like spike. Okay, so this is what we draw. It's like a triangular shape. Okay, so we draw the frontal bone, nasal frontal, frontonasal suture and then the nasal bone. After that, we go to the inner outline of the cella torsica and the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. So this is the cranial base. This is the Cella torsica, you can see it's like a, a almost a round structure. Okay, so we draw this as well. And this is representing the cranial base and the cella torsica. And after that, we go to the maxilla, including the palatal bone and bony shadow of palate behind upper incisors. So basically, the maxilla is a little bit difficult because the anterior part of it is uh, overlapped with the um, with the cheeks so you can see this is straight line represent the cheeks and if your um if your patient is cheeky you can actually see that it's round it's, it's this area is actually round and sometimes you have overlap between the right and the left cheeks so you need to be careful the anterior part of the maxilla to be able to trace it you look at the cement enamel junction here for the incisors and you look at the most anterior part of the maxilla which is the anterior nasal spine don't look at the at the nasal um cartilage we, we don't want this we want the bony part so this is exactly where the anterior nasal spine so this is the anterior nasal spine and this is the cement enamel junction in between you should now see a c-shaped area c-shaped area okay so this is the anterior border of the maxilla so this is a c-shaped area the anterior part of the maxilla and then you move on to the palate and then the posterior nasal spine, and then the lower border of the palate, all the way till you reach the cement enamel junction in the palatal area, okay? So this is how you draw the maxilla. The posterior nasal spine is sometimes difficult because the developing wisdom is usually overlapping it. So we look at what we call the pterygo maxillary fissure, and it looks like an upside down shape, uh, drop shape. The relationship so, um, between the pterygo maxillary fissure and the palate, you can see this is the junction. This is exactly where your posterior nasal spine is. Okay. And this is how you draw <coughs> your maxilla. Now the mandible is a little bit easier than the maxilla, and we should include the synthesis. 
Again, from the cement enamel junction, we move down. This is a C shape, more very clear, nothing to overlap it compared to the maxilla. This is the synthesis, outer part of the synthesis, and then the inner part of the synthesis. And then the lower border of the mandible, you usually have two borders because we have the right and the left side overlapping. You actually, you need to trace both. The lower border of the first mandible, the ramus, the condyle, and then the lower border of the second mandible, usually the ramus overlap with each other. And then all the way to the condyle. Upper and lower incisors, upper and lower first molars, okay? So you trace the incisors the incisal itch, the incisal apex, and then in between you draw uh, the shape of the incisor, the lower incisal itch, the lower incisal apex, and then you draw the shape of the uh, incisor. For the first permanent molar, it's easier to count from backward. So this is the wisdom, this is the seven, and this is the first permanent molar. This is the wisdom, this is the seven, and this is the, the lower first permanent molar, okay? So you trace it. And, and now this is what you should have on your tracing paper. The soft tissue outline, the bony outline representing the frontal bone, uh, uh, frontal nasal suture, the nasal bone. Um, this is the uh, cranial base, this, the uh, cella torsica, trigomaxillary fissure, and this is the maxilla including the anterior nasal spine, posterior nasal spine, upper border of the palate, lower border of the palate, and the upper incisor, and the upper first molar. And then we have the mandible, where we have the lower incisor, the symphysis, the outer, uh, the outer part of it, and the inner part of it. The lower border of the mandible, the second border should have been traced, and this is the condyle. But usually we should also draw uh, a circle that represents the porion, the external auditory meatus the external of the trimetus, and usually it is positioned uh, a little bit posteriorly and superiorly to the uh, head of the condyle at this area here. We should also uh, trace the uh, orbit, and this is the orbit. You can see that we have two lines, so usually we trace both and we take the average. So this is the tracing of the orbit. Okay, now we have finished the tracing of the outlines. Now comes the second stage. The second stage is identification of points. Identification of points, we're going to start with the S point, which is the cella. And the cella represents the center of the hypophysal posta, the cella torsica. In point is the nasion, and the nasion is the most anterior part of the frontonasal suture. And then we have the A point, and the A point is the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the maxilla within the sagittal plane. Okay? And B point is the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the mandible within the sagittal plane. Okay, so let's look at these four points on the uh, on an already traced paper. So you can see that the middle of the cella torsica is the S point here, exactly here. And then the most anterior part of the front of the nasal suture is the end point. This C shape that we talked about, the deepest part of it is the A point. And again, the C shape that is uh, referred to the mandible, the anterior part of the mandible, the deepest part here is the B point. Okay. And usually when you want to locate the points, it's better to use an X uh, shape instead of a, a dot because a dot will, it will be difficult to connect uh, the lines uh, because you can go to the upper part of the dot, lower part of the dot, the middle of the dot, so you'll have lots of sources of errors, and this will affect reliability. So it's better to go with an X because an X will, there is, you're not gonna be confused where to go with your lines when you connect them together. The next points are Bougonian, and Bougonian is the most anterior, the most prominent part of the bony chin, or the synthesis, anterior part of the synthesis. Gnathian is the most anterior, inferior part of the angle of the synthesis in the anterior region. And Minton is the most inferior part of the synthesis, the lowest point of the synthesis, okay? So again, the most prominent part of the synthesis here is the Pogonian. 
The lowest part of the symphysis here is called the menton, in between the most inferior anterior part. Right here is the gnathion. We move on to the anterior nasal spine, and it is the most anterior point on the maxilla at the nasal base. Posterior nasal spine is the tip of the posterior nasal spine of the palatal palatine bone at the junction of the soft and hard palate. Trigomaxillary fissure is the point at the base of the fissure uh, where the anterior and posterior wall meet. Okay. So, as we said for the anterior nasal spine, we need to ignore the cartilage of the nose. Uh, we need to look at where the uh, bony part of the maxilla anteriorly uh, start to finish. This is the anterior nasal spine. And then the posterior nasal spine is the most posterior part of the uh, palate is the junction between the hard palate and the soft palate right here. Usually this point is difficult to locate if you have a developing wisdom. So we use the trigomaxillary fissure in order to help to locate this point. Okay. Next is the basium and it's the most anterior margin of the foramen magnum. Arbitali is the most inferior anterior point on the margin of the orbit. So here, here is the orbit. The most inferior anterior part here is the orbitali. Basion is the most uh, anterior part of the foramen. This is the foramen magnum. The most anterior part is the basion here. Gonion is the most posterior inferior point on the angle of the mandible. I can determine it by estimation, or I can actually, actually measure it. I can, I, I can mathematically determine it. Uh, articulari is a point, uh, is an imaginary point at the mandible of ramus, where uh, the uh, posterior, uh, uh, posterior border of the ramus actually intersect with the basilar portion of the occipital bone. So it's not a real anatomy, it's an imaginary line uh, point. Parian is the uppermost point on the bony external auditory meatus. Okay, so here the gonion we can go to a line that represents the lower border of the mandible. We're not talking about the line that is connecting any points. It's just the line that represents the lower border of the mandible. And another line that represents the orientation of the ramus, regardless of the condyle and the head of the condyle, okay? We're not talking about the condyle, we're talking about the ramus. So two lines, a line that represents the orientation of the ramus, another line that represents the lower border of the mandible. We take half of this angle, we bisect this angle, and where it meets the, uh, the uh, uh, posterior angle of the mandible, this is exactly the gonion, okay? So the gonion is located at the angle of the mandible. So this is a mathematical way to do it. Otherwise, we can actually, actually estimate it. We can say it's the lowest, the most inferior posterior part of the angle of the mandible. Uh, this is the imaginary point, the articulari and it's the junction between the posterior border of the ramus and the uh, basilar bone uh, from the occipital bone. Uh, Parian is, as we said, uh, the exterior of the terimeters is uh, uh, a void, uh, a black circle here that represent, uh, usually presented with the ear rods if properly positioned, if properly positioned. But we look at the anatomy, usually it is positioned a little bit posteriorly and superiorly to the head of the condyle. The most up the upper part, the uppermost part of this uh, external determinatus is called the parian. Okay. So this to represent uh, again how we do the mathematical way to measure the um, uh, or to decide on the position of the gonion. So this is the lower border of the mandible, and this is the orientation of the ramus. And if you bisect it, usually the gonion will be here. So sometimes it's a little bit different from the uh, estimated uh, point. Right, so let's go back to our points just to remind you that so we have the S that represents the middle of the cella torsica, this point right here. We have the, the most anterior part of the frontonasal suture, that's the end point. Orbitali is the most inferior anterior part of the orbit. And then the porion is the upper most part of the external auditory, auditory meatus. Trigomaxillary point represent, represented on the trigomaxillary fissure. 
uh, or articulari is the junction between the posterior border of the ramus and the uh, basilar part of the occipital bone. And the most anterior part of the uh, foramen magnum is the basium. And here we come to the anterior nasal spine and the posterior nasal spine of the maxilla, the A point that represents the deepest concavity of the anterior uh, surface of the maxilla within the sagittal plane. And then we have here the upper incisal uh, um, edge and the upper incisal apex, the lower incisal edge, the lower incisal apex. And then we have here the B point that represents the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the mandible within the sagittal plane. Pogonian that represents the most prominent part of the chin of the bony symphysis. Gnathian is positioned in between the Pogonian and the Minton is the most anterior inferior part of the symphysis. The most inferior is called Minton. And finally, we have the Gonian that represents the angle of the mandible. Usually it's the most inferior posterior part of the angle <coughs> of the mandible. Right. Um, I think I will go back to one of the radiographs to show you on the radiograph uh, how to locate the points, but uh, we actually covered this chapter all the way to the points here. Okay. Next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, reference, uh, reference lines and then specific analysis. Uh, and we will leave uh, for the third lecture so the cephalometric errors and some applications. We're going to show you some examples of a proper cephalometric analysis. So I'll just move to um, one of the radiographs that we have. For example, this one. I'll just make it bigger so it's easier for you to see. Right. So again, the first thing we do is to um, just take the hands. I'm going to work my back now. That is solid. Okay. Right. Um, so basically, uh, the points. Uh, uh, sorry, the the first stage, as we said, is the outline, exactly like I showed you. So the soft tissue outline, bony outline, and then point identification. We're going to start with the most anterior part of the frontonasal suture. Right here, I'm just going to use my pen. Exactly here. This is the end point, nasian. And then this cellular torsica, the middle part of the cellular torsica here is the uh, S point. And then as you can see, this is the orbit, the most inferior anterior part of the orbit here is the orbitali, and this is the head of the condyle, and you can see this is a circle, a void circle, that represents the external detrimatus. The upper part of it is the porion, and down here we move to the, you can see actually the pterygo maxillary fissure. This is the pterygo maxillary fissure, and this is the junction here, exactly the posterior nasal spine. Um, actually, I don't like it. We're going to move to uh, just this point. Okay. Um, I think it's a little bit yellow. Yeah. So the posterior nasal spine and the most anterior part, ignoring the cartilage of the nose. This is the anterior nasal spine. And this is the S shape. You need to look carefully. You need to ignore the straight line that represents the cheek. So this is the A point. And here you can see that we have a rich client incisor. This is the upper incisal edge and the upper incisal apex. This is the lower incisal edge and the lower incisal apex. And this is the deepest part of the anterior surface of the mandible represented here. This is the B point. The most anterior part is the Bugonian. The most inferior part is the Menton. And in between is the Gnathian. Now we have two lines that represent the a mandible, the most inferior posterior part uh, on average is going to be somewhere here. That represents the Gonian point. Gonian. Okay. Um, I think these are uh, the main points. Oh, yeah. Here we have the articulary that represents um, a point, um, imaginary point, actually, the junction between the basilar part of the occipital bone and the head of the condyle. And then the end of this almost 
um, I can see maybe almost here is the most is the basal uh, point that represents the anterior part of the uh, foramen magnum. Okay, so this is uh, just to review uh, exactly uh, the uh, landmark identification uh, to be able next uh, lecture to continue with the drawing of lines and some measurements. Thank you for listening.